On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman is convicted in the murder of her adoptive grandmother. Jessica was one that suggested that putting a bag over her head to kill Joyce. I was aware of what was going on, but it was like I had no control over it. Like I was scared to do anything, say anything. Then, Shannon Buard is found guilty of killing an innocent bystander at a neighborhood dice game. She had something to prove to somebody that they just wasn't going to win. And that's what she did. She retaliated. Her daughter looked up at her, shook her head, and, and exhaled her last breath and died, leaving little two-year-old baby Charles motherless. Two women, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Jessica Gentry and Shannon Buard. On February 12, 1999, a construction company discovered the body of a woman floating in a creek bed below a bridge. Just into the water was a partially submerged body. We didn't have any indication who she would be. The Jane Doe was later identified as 57-year-old Carolyn Joyce Thomas. The investigation led to the victim's granddaughter, 21-year-old Jessica Gentry, and her friends Sean Barclay and Drew Alexander. Sean and, and Drew put a, a bag over her head and suffocated her. Jessica was their access into Joyce's home so the killing could be accomplished. Her obsession with Sean Barkley is what drove her involvement. All I wanted was him. I never wanted her to die. Was Jessica Gentry the mastermind in a plot to murder her grandmother? Or was she unable to stop her boyfriend from committing the crime? I was born at Parkland Memorial Hospital. My early years, I spent roaming around. My parents were nomads, never had a stable place. Her father, he's an alcoholic and did drugs and couldn't ever hold a job down. And her mother, she couldn't stay off the booze. When Jessica was three, her birth mother had Jessica's brother, Jason, and Justin joined the family three years later. At six years old, Jessica found herself in what she says was an unstable parental environment, taking care of her young siblings. My main concern was my brothers. I did everything to look out for them. At one time, they were living in the back of their car out the lake. Jessica claims her early childhood was also colored by abuse from her biological father. He was real abusive towards my mom. He was abusive towards me, physical abuse, sexual abuse. In 1983, when Jessica was seven years old, her biological parents realized they were unable to support their children. Her father told us that he couldn't take care of them anymore. So we went over and picked them up. Sandy and her husband, Royce Gentry, Jessica's biological uncle, who had no children of their own, adopted both Jessica and Jason. Another aunt took Jessica's baby brother, Justin. For the seven-year-old girl, the ordeal was emotionally damaging. I felt abandoned, and I grew up feeling like I was trash. And that's just the way I felt growing up all my life. With new parents, Jessica finally got to have a childhood. I didn't have to worry about where I was going to sleep, where my next meal was going to come from. But in school, the young girl's insecurities continued to mount. From the very beginning, I was always the outcast. She struggled in school. Jessica was a follower. If you told her to go jump off the side of the cliff, she probably would, just to have a friend. When Jessica was 14 years old, her adoptive parents, Royce and Sandy, divorced. Jessica chose to stay with Royce, but she quickly started to rebel. I was skipping class. I had started falling in with the wrong kids, and I started drinking and smoking cigarettes. Jessica also struggled with her weight, which made her feel even lonelier during her high school years. Jessica was a heavy set girl, but she was a very pretty girl. But she didn't feel that way. Being overweight is like you would do anything to be accepted. Um, sleeping with the boys, just, it didn't matter whoever. 
um, just whatever they wanted. Jessie used sex to get boys to like her. Jessie had, Jessie didn't feel like anybody could like her. She just had no self-esteem whatsoever. At age 16, Jessica moved in with Sandy and her new husband. During the week, she stayed in Alvarado with Sandy's mother, Carolyn Joyce Thomas, known as Joyce, so that she could attend a better school. It was really freedom to me because my grandmother didn't, didn't hold a, a fist over me. But Jessica returned to Sandy's house every weekend, where they eventually realized that the arrangement was not working out. They seen that I was getting out of control. I started smoking marijuana and getting into the heavier drugs, and so they brought me back, bought a new house, put me in a different school district. Sandy and her husband enrolled Jessica in her third high school, which was in Arlington. In 1997, she finally earned her diploma. I had repeated grades six and nine, and I was 20, fixing to be 21 when I graduated. Fresh out of high school, Jessica was more interested in partying than going to work. She had a job, and we couldn't figure out why she wasn't going to work. I found reasons to call in, go hang out with my friends, and sneak out at night, and just, I went crazy. Jessica would either get fired because of her drug use, or she just preferred to mooch off of others instead of supporting herself. At that job, they did random drug tests. And when I knew the drug test was coming up, I just stopped going to work. Well, they called, and that's how she found out. I said, Jessica, what are you doing? And she says, I'm smoking pot. And I said, when are you smoking this pot? I have some in my bedroom right now. She was hurt, and my stepfather couldn't take me abusing my mom like that, and he just put me out with nothing. Jessica was concerned about one person, and that was herself. And even when people would try to help her, she would take advantage of people, even those that loved her. On her own, Jessica worked odd jobs and got an apartment with friends. But everything changed when she met Sean Barclay. I don't believe in love at first sight, but that's what it felt like. I knew that he was gonna change my life. I didn't know it was gonna be like this, but I knew that somehow we were gonna be connected forever for the rest of our lives. When Jesse met him, he was just bouncing around. He had been to the penitentiary before for a burglary of a habitation. He didn't work. He generally just lived off other people. He had a girlfriend, but he started living with me. We became inseparable. According to her, she loved him a whole lot more than he loved her, but I think that both Sean and Jessica were using each other. In the meantime, Jessica could no longer pay rent, so she turned to her grandmother for help. I had called him and asked her if I could come stay with her, and she let me come with the promise that I was gonna get a job and help her pay her bills. When Women Behind Bars continues, Jessica helped in the, the planning of the killing. They wanted to find out what it was like to kill a person. I said, just, just dump her right here. In 1998, 21-year-old Jessica Gentry was unable to hold down a job due to drug use. She appealed to her adoptive grandmother, Carolyn Joyce Thomas, to take her in. She spoiled us. She would spend lots of money on clothes and shoes and food. She was loving, but I never felt like I was her granddaughter. I always felt like my cousins, who were her biological blood, were who she cared for most. Mom did say something to Jessica several times about, Jessica, you need to get out and find a job, but she never did. Then Jessica began taking advantage of Joyce's hospitality. When she would go to sleep, I would take her keys and go and see Sean. One night, while Jessica was on the phone with Sean and their friend, 18-year-old Drew Alexander, Sean made a comment about her grandmother. Sean wanted me to come over. And I told him that my grandmother was still awake. He was like, well, put her to bed. I didn't take it as anything. It was just boys talking. But the topic resurfaced several days later. And they were talking about ways to kill somebody, and everybody was participating. Things that we had seen in the movies, they'd read in books. Somehow they began talking about how they could go about killing Miss Thomas. Jessica was one that suggested that putting a bag over her head to kill Joyce. 
Gentry says the subject did not come up again until two weeks later. On February 11, 1999, Jessica had an argument with her grandmother when she was caught sneaking Sean into the house. She was telling me that she wanted him out the house. And I kept promising her, he'll be gone, he'll be gone. Well, he never left. Sean hung out with Jessica that day while her grandmother was at work. He just stood up and said, I'm going to kill her. And I was like, what? Jessica maintains she still didn't take Sean seriously. Later that night, when Joyce came home from work, Jessica's boyfriend made a declaration. Sean Barkley said, tonight is the night, or it has to be done now, or something along those lines. According to Jessica, Sean had made up his mind to kill her grandmother. All I know is that Sean kept talking about the car. The car was a sense of freedom. I can't say that that's why he killed her. And at the time, that's all he talked about. Jessica says she felt powerless and could not oppose her boyfriend. She was afraid. Jessie is the type of person she's not going to argue. She also was madly in love with Sean Barkley, and Sean Barkley and her grandmother did not get along. I wanted Sean to come live with me, to be closer. I didn't like the fact that he was all the way out in Fort Worth. But according to the prosecution, it was Jessica who pressured Sean into killing her grandmother all along. The motive uh, in, in this case was to simply get her car. I think that Jessica knew that her grandmother was getting ready to kick her out, and she wanted to use her grandmother's property. And when Jessica said that she wanted to know what it was like to kill someone, I think that that was a large part of the motive. Sean had tried to sneak up on Miss Thomas and was not successful, and Sean was angry with himself for not being able to just attack this woman and kill her. So Miss Thomas lies down on the couch and goes to sleep, and Sean recruited Jesse to kill her grandmother, and she says, I'm not helping you. Jessica claims she called their friend Drew Alexander to help her calm Sean down. Sean ended up taking my grandmother's keys and going to pick Drew up, and by the time they got back, it was like Sean had convinced Drew that this is what they were going to do. But the prosecution contended that it was Jessica who had enlisted Drew to participate in the murder of her grandmother. All three of them wanted to find out what it was like to kill a person. And Jessica knew that Sean was going to kill her grandmother. And actually, when Sean said that he couldn't do it himself, she called Drew to recruit him to come over and help. They put a either a pillow or a garbage bag over her nose, precluding her from breathing. Uh, that was Sean Barkley that did that. Drew was holding her feet down. And then after they thought she was dead, they put a cigarette out on her leg to try to make sure that she was dead. Jessie says that she was in her bedroom. She put a pillow over her ears to try not to hear. It was like an out-of-body experience it was like I had no control, like I was scared to do anything, say anything. But Jessica was perfectly in control, according to the prosecution. She heard her grandmother screaming, and the dogs started barking. So Jessica got up and put the dogs in another room so that they'd quiet down. There was virtually no credible evidence that Jessica was acting under duress or under the domination or intimidation of these two guys. Gentry claims that once Joyce had died, she peeked out the door into the darkened living room. I saw just like a lump on the couch, and I saw Sean standing over the lump and Drew sitting on it, and I knew it was my grandmother. I immediately closed the door and just laid on my bed and cried. According to Jessica, she remained in her bedroom until the boys came to get her. Sean told me to go out and just wait in the car. They wrapped her in garbage bags and put her in the trunk of the Toyota, and the three of them drove around looking for a location to dump the body. I was scared, and I was throwing up. They eventually ended up on a farm to market road in the southwestern portion of Tarrant County. I panicked, and I said, just, just dump her right here, you know, just 
Let's get rid of the body. Drew and Sean took Joyce's body out of the trunk and literally tossed it over the side of the bridge to the creek bed below while Jessica was uh, acting more or less as a lookout. After they disposed of the body, they went back to Miss Thomas's residence. Drew Alexander made a comment that, you don't know my name, I'm not here, so he goes back to wherever he goes. While Jessica and Sean slept, a construction crew 30 miles away made a grisly discovery. I received a dispatch call to go to a, a bridge area and just into the water was a partially submerged body. Uh, it's obviously, it was a white female, uh, older lady. The body was lying partially on, on the right side, but pretty much face up, uh, with the head toward the bridge and the, and the feet back upstream here. Black trash bags were still around her feet, and she had on just kind of a pastel print nightgown. The body was originally a, a Jane Doe. As the Tarrant County Sheriff's Department began their investigation on the unidentified woman, Sandy Malone started to worry about her mother. Mom was killed the day before my birthday of 1999. And Mom didn't call me that day. I'm sorry. I just thought that maybe she was working and that she didn't have time. I thought, well, she'll call me tomorrow. She'd call me the next day either. When Women Behind Bars continues. I absolutely believe that Jessica Gentry was the mastermind of this. And I told her that that means you spend the rest of your life in a four by four cell. I hope you think about it every day. And later in this episode of Women Behind Bars, a dice game turns deadly. That's all she kept saying. My only daughter, why you killed my daughter? On February 12th, 1999, Jessica Gentry hid in her bedroom while her boyfriend, Sean Barclay, and their friend, Drew Alexander, smothered her grandmother, 57-year-old Carolyn Joyce Thomas. The three friends then dumped the body over a bridge where it was soon found, but not identified. Jessica and Sean made plans to leave town. He said, well, we'll just take the stuff from your grandmother's house and we'll pawn it. He took VCRs and a TV, microwave, and uh, video cassettes. Sean didn't have a picture ID, so that left it up to me to pawn everything. On February 13th, Jessica went to two pawn shops in the far western side of Fort Worth, and that netted them a sum of $180. The last night, that we were actually here in Texas. Sean told me that he and Andrew had been talking about what they would do to me if I ever called the laws on them. And I just, I remember looking at Sean, I was like, I wouldn't do that. It didn't dawn on me that my family was gonna be in pain. The only thing I couldn't fathom was losing Sean. Jessica continued following the boy's lead, but she says her fear of Sean was mounting. Whatever Sean Barkley told her to do, for whatever reason, Jesse was under the power to do it. Barclay and Gentry took Joyce's car and drove to Memphis, Tennessee. Meanwhile, Jessica's mom, Sandy, was growing more concerned about the whereabouts of her mother. I get a phone call from my brother asking me if I heard from mom. He says her job's looking for her. I called the Arlington Police Department to make a missing person report. Sandy met the officers at Joyce's duplex in Arlington. There was a, a little bit of, of, of blood in the, in the apartment. We found a, a letter written by Jessica laying on the dining room table, and it states, Granny, I'm sorry about the way I've been acting. Then down at the bottom it says, by the way, tell Mom I said happy birthday. Love, Jessica. And then there was a PS on the note and it said, I took a couple of pieces of your candy. The day after the report was filed, police got a hit on the Jane Doe found several days earlier in Tarrant County. They were able to determine that the body of the victim was that of Carolyn Joyce Thomas. Police zeroed in on Jessica Gentry as their number one suspect. Investigators tracked her down at a motel in Memphis. And they told Jessica, uh, your grandmother's missing. Do you know where she's at? No. 
They got a hold of the Memphis police. They wouldn't have found the vehicle. It was mother's. The detective uh, obtained warrants for Sean Barkley and Jessica Gentry for the murder of Joyce. He convinced me to come back by telling me that that at that point I wasn't a, a, a suspect. My family needed my help. I told him that I would be back. I told him the next day I'd go get a bus ticket and we'd be back. When we drove into Dallas and we got to the terminal, I seen the detective standing there and I told Sean they're here to get us. On February 17th, five days after the murder, Jessica Gentry and Sean Barclay were arrested at a bus station in downtown Dallas. Drew Alexander was apprehended the next day. She was charged with capital murder, which is a murder committed in the course of committing a robbery. Jessica gave a lengthy statement to the Arlington Homicide Detective. As far as what had happened to my grandmother, there was points where I was just convinced myself, well, it didn't matter. I still had Sean. I contacted Sandy and she hung up on me. I said, I don't want to talk to her. We find out we just lost our mother and the way we lost her. And then we find out that we have a daughter involved in it. She was obviously grieving for her mother and she was grieving somewhat for Jessica too because this was a child that she had helped raise and she wanted Jessica to come to justice. Whenever the district attorney tells me that we're going to trial and we're not gonna go for the death penalty, I was furious. I couldn't understand why I should give three people the chance to live the rest of their life in prison when they did not give my mother that choice. There's no question in my mind that Jesse did not instigate this. This was Sean Barkley's idea. He did it solely to get Ms. Thomas's vehicle. I absolutely believe that Jessica Gentry was the mastermind of this, that uh, but for the actions of Jessica Gentry here, none of this would have happened, and Joyce would still be alive. They said that I was manipulative, that I was narcissistic. I was 286 pounds. I had no self-esteem. My actions at the time were because I just wanted acceptance. It was our theory at trial that her fear, as well as her obsession with Sean Barkley, is what drove her involvement in this offense. The defense tried to say that Jessica went along with the murders because she was afraid of Sean and Drew. That was contrived in Jessica's mind only, and we had in our possession some letters that uh, really blew that defensive theory right out of the water. Perhaps Jessica, in her own mind, had, had thoughts of marrying Sean Barkley. The letter was atrocious. After they were arrested for the murder of Joyce, Jessica wrote Sean a letter expressing her love for Sean and asking that they put this whole incident behind them. And she never once showed or stated any concern about what they had done to her grandmother. The contents of that letter really hurt her. So too did her testimony. Gentry failed to elicit any sympathy from the jury when she took the stand. The jury did not care for Jessica. This young lady came off really is a very cold individual that didn't appear to really give any second thought to the murder of her grandmother. I was living outside of myself for that whole time that I was there. On December 2nd, 1999, after three days of testimony, the jury delivered its verdict. Jessica Gentry was guilty of capital murder. Jessica was convicted as a party to the offense, and a party under Texas law can be convicted and sentenced just as the principal can. I'm not saying that I'm innocent, but as far as being guilty of taking her life, 
It's not my fault. I paid the biggest price as far as my freedom. Gentry was sentenced to life in prison. At the conclusion of the trial, Sandy made a very um, moving and heartfelt uh, allocution statement. And I told her that I forgave her, but it doesn't mean I can have anything to do with you. What you did, you have to pay for it. So if that means you spend the rest of your life in a four by four cell, I hope you think about it every day. Gentry must spend 40 years in prison before she is eligible for parole. She is serving her sentence at a maximum security prison in Gatesville, Texas. Jessica tries to stay positive. I've been working to get certified as a Braille typist, just trying to keep my mind occupied where I won't just give up and die. Her family is still coping with their loss. She took so much away from this family. Mom has two granddaughters that don't have her around anymore. I'm still angry, but like, I can forgive her because I know that it's the right thing to do, but I will never be able to forget what she's done. I don't even want to think about her. It just makes me so upset. To this day, I can't give my family closure. I can't answer their questions as to why. and it was needless. <laughs> and now, I wish I could take it back. Next up on Women Behind Bars. She had a gun down by her side. She had something to prove to somebody, and that's what she did. She retaliated. For more information about women behind bars, go to wetv.com. On a warm April afternoon in 1998, shots were fired into a courtyard where neighbors played cards and dice at an apartment complex in South Dallas. A 19-year-old girl, Shawana Moss, was struck in the chest. The bullet pierces her heart and she dies almost instantly. The suspect of the shooting was 28-year-old Shannon Buard. Addicted to drugs, Shannon allegedly spun into a rage when she lost her crack cocaine money in a craps game. Her intention was to injure the man running the table, Lester Earl Boyd. He was a person that Miss Buard had her dispute with. He was shot in the leg. He survived that shooting. Shannon thought that because she just didn't mean to kill Shawana that she, that she shouldn't be in trouble and wouldn't be. Maybe it was an accident, but she was killed. Was the death of Shawana Moss an accident, or did Shannon Buard shoot to kill? Shannon Yvette Buard grew up in the tough Oak Cliff section of South Dallas. Opportunity is not there. There's, there's not a lot of money flowing through Oak Cliff, and the kids uh, in the neighborhood is doing whatever they can to survive. Shannon had a very rough childhood. She was a rebel in the family, and she didn't like authority, uh, and she didn't have a father figure. Reviewing Shannon's case, I would suspect maybe a mismanaged home in which she was allowed too much freedom as a child. Shannon attended Sarah Zumwalt Middle School, but dropped out in the eighth grade when she discovered she was pregnant. On March 17, 1983, the 13-year-old gave birth to a son, Antoine. She had a child when she was very young, and it did formulate her life because she had to be a responsible parent, and she was not. Two years later, she had another son, Dominique. But instead of caring for her kids, Shannon used drugs to escape from the reality of her difficult situation. It was pretty tough on Dominique and his brother. He said a lot of times they was at home alone by themselves. He said his mother was doing some drugs when they was kids. Shannon had the bad 
bad end of the stick as far as raising the kids and, and not being there as a mother for them and not a good example, uh, leaving them, walking out on them. Quite possibly she used to self-heal or medicate some of the traumas that had happened in her life. Crack cocaine was Shannon's drug of choice, and the addiction was fierce. It quickly consumed her life. The crack cocaine seemingly makes everything else go away. Drugs are more important to an addict than their, their children, their parents, their siblings, um, anything. She was not emotionally capable of being a, a, a stay-at-home mom. In 1987, Shannon was arrested on theft charges. Soon after, her young sons were taken away and placed in foster care. She wanted to be a mom, but she got into the drugs, and, and it just changed her life. Those children had to be taken away, and her life was changed forever. Shannon's drug use intensified when she turned to prostitution as a means of supporting her habit. It's very, very easy to exchange sex for drugs. They don't have to hustle money. They don't have to hold a job. There's someone out there always pulling these young girls in. It's a very rough neighborhood, tough, uh, lots of drugs, prostitution, criminal activity. I don't know how anyone makes it over there, but people have to live that way because they have no other avenues out. She probably used the prostitution to support the drug habit, and the drug habit, in turn, fueled the need to be a prostitute. Just an endless cycle. Once you become a prostitute, there's no going back from that because of the shame. Buard also continued to have run-ins with the law. Majority of her arrests were for, they were mainly for narcotics, for prostitution, and for theft offenses. And uh, she had quite a few arrests in all of those categories. Meanwhile, Shannon's sons were adopted by their foster family, the Littletons. Her youngest, Dominique, was poised to head down a similar path of drugs and crime until Greg Hatley intervened. Hatley had started the Oak Cliff Boxing Club, a gym for kids in the community. We started training and uh, picking up little guys, you know, around the corner, and Dominique was one of them. Every day we'd pick him up and uh, bring him to the gym and uh, train him. Boxing really was like another life to him, for him, you know. It's like something he looked forward to every day. He was definitely full of talent, and uh, he was just looking for something to get some of that anger out on. As Dominique Littleton honed his boxing skills, his mother, Shannon Buard, was living just five miles away at the general rental apartments. The complex was a low-rent housing area on Diceman Avenue and Birdsong Drive in Oak Cliff. It was a very crime-ridden apartment complex uh, in a crime-ridden area of Dallas. Two of Shannon's neighbors were Katima Moss and her 19-year-old daughter, Shawana. Katima was a hardworking woman. She supported her daughter, Shawana. Shawana had just graduated. She had just got a job, and she was trying to raise her son that she had just had. Being people without opportunity, they had to live in places that they could afford, and unfortunately, this was one. Katima and Shawana started a card game in the courtyard as a way of socializing. Other tenants joined them, playing games and hanging out. These apartments on Diceman had a, a large courtyard, and Katima and Shawana and two other friends were playing cards, and they're just enjoying the day. About two or three tables out there, and they was all sitting there playing cards and dominoes, and they was gambling. Shannon was upstairs in her apartment smoking crack with a friend. When they ran out of drugs, she left with her last $5 to score more crack. She decided to try her luck at the craps table, manned by Lester Earl Boyd. Shannon makes her first bet $2, which she loses. The next bet she makes is for the final $3. But during this throw, she rolled a, what's called a cocked die. One of the die didn't land fully on the ground. So her contention was that she was entitled to an extra roll of the dice. Lester said, no, that's not the case, you lost, and took her money. Shannon Buar didn't think that was fair. She was just furious about this. According to witnesses, Shannon became enraged and screamed profanities at Boyd. There's statements that Shannon picked up a brick, threatened Lester with it. Lester, in turn, goes to his car, gets a gun, which he sticks in his waistband. She 
had a mean streak in her. The attitude that she had with everybody, you know, it's like she had something to prove. She was ready to fight just if you made her mad. Crack cocaine tends to elevate any emotion that you have. If you're angry, it tends to send you into a tailspin of rage. In Shannon's case, she was angry, obviously, that she had lost her $3. That was her crack cocaine money. And from her point of view, I mean, her life had just ended. I heard two people arguing, and I looked up out the window. Shannon walked up the driveway like she was going home. Instead, Buard went to a friend's apartment to borrow a weapon. I heard her coming back, and she had a gun down by her side. She was saying to herself, uh, they got me uh, messed up, and it, it just ain't going to be like this. She had something to prove to somebody, and that's what she did. She retaliated. When Women Behind Bars continues, she lifted the gun and said, all y'all, big and small, and just open fire. By 1998, 28-year-old Shannon Buard had spent time in jail for prostitution, theft, and drugs, had her kids taken away, and struggled with an addiction to crack cocaine. On April 18th, a dispute over $3 lost in a dice game pushed Shannon over the edge. After engaging in a verbal altercation, Buard retreated to a neighbor's apartment to get a gun. The weapon is an SKS 7.62. It's a assault rifle. It's meant to cause as much damage to a person's body as it possibly can. Everyone was sitting around the card table. She was peeking around the corner, um, and they saw her doing that, and they were laughing at her. When she rounded the corner, she lifted the gun. She stepped back on her right leg, throwed the gun up, and caught it with her left. She says, all y'all, big and small, and opens fire. And then she dropped it back beside her and walked back down the driveway. I was up in that window, and while all this was going on, I could hear people screaming and hollering, so I ran that way, too. The actual intended target of, of the shooting was Lester Boyd. He was the person that was conducting the dice game. He was the person that Miss Buard had her dispute with. He was shot in the leg. Uh, he survived that shooting. But 19-year-old Shawana Moss, a new mother, got caught in the line of fire. Shawana Moss is struck in the side of her chest. Katima, Shawana's mother, who was right there, runs around the apartments thinking that her daughter is behind her. When she realizes she's not, she goes to her daughter. And that's when we seen the uh, young lady laying flat on her back. And her mother was in a state of shock. I could see her picking chairs up and slinging them behind her, trying to get to her daughter and was calling her daughter's name. And they ran to the front and called the ambulance from the payphone. Katima is literally holding her in her arms as her daughter and exhaled her last breath and died leaving little two-month baby Charles motherless. The ambulance rushed Shawana to Baylor Hospital, where doctors attempted to revive her. The shooting actually occurred at approximately 6.30 p.m. Uh, Miss Moss was transported to the hospital, and the doctor declared her deceased at uh, 7.05 p.m. Meanwhile, Shannon returned the gun to her neighbor and fled. Soon after, officers from the Dallas Police Department arrived at the general rental apartment complex. When the police officers got there, they were given a physical description of who was involved. According to Shannon, she returned to the scene to explain to the police that she did not intend to shoot Shawana. She thought because she was having a fight with Lester and she killed someone else by accident, that she'd be OK. Other witnesses remember it differently. She hid in the dumpster. And people seen her coming out the dumpster. She walked back towards the general room. I mean, walked past police and everything. Shanna did not approach the police. There were people at the scene who said, that's her. That's the woman who committed the crime. And so the police apprehended her there. I seen the mother start trying to fight her and the police and stuff, grabbed her. And they had her shot him and put her in the car. And she wanted to know, how come you killed my daughter? That's all she kept saying. My only daughter, why you killed my daughter? Buard was taken to Dallas Police Headquarters, where she confessed to the shooting. I made her a plea bargain offer, offer of 40 years. She turned it down. That's her option. And so you just roll the dice. 
she still believed that she didn't do anything wrong because the mind is so messed up with drugs, you, you have an illusion as to what really happened at the time. Shannon Board was charged with first degree murder under the theory of transferred intent, which means that um, if you intend to kill one person, but then miss and hit another person, your intent to kill is transferred to the person that you actually killed. The defense argued that Lester Earl Boyd pointed a gun at Shannon and threatened to kill her. The allegations from Shannon was that Lester had a gun. Lester admitted during the trial that he had a gun in his pocket, but denied ever pointing it at Shannon. Maybe he just flashed it on a razor shirt or something. I did not see him point no gun at him. But all it had everything to do with self-defense, the whole, the whole trial, of course, because that's the only way she could get out from under this but I couldn't prove it. She went upstairs and got that gun and, and opened fire because she was mad because they were all laughing at her. She had a great deal of remorse, even all the way through the trial. I mean, she never intended to ever hurt that girl. During the trial, she cried a lot. Um, I, I think a lot of it was also sorry for herself. And on the witness stand, when she testified, when she said, I didn't mean to kill that girl. I was trying to shoot Earl. They weren't sympathetic to, to her. On February 26th, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. Shannon Buard was sentenced to 85 years in prison and given a $10,000 fine. The jury was really, really pissed. This little girl should never have died. Over what? Over $3 and some crack. As Shannon adjusted to prison life in Gatesville, Texas, her son Dominique Littleton thrived as an up-and-coming boxer. Dominique was a three-time Dallas Golden Glove champion, two-time Texas State champion. He's a two-time national champion. Became ranked number two in the United States at uh, 18 years old. So he had quite a bit of accomplishment in, in the boxing, amateur boxing arena. But despite his success, Dominique struggled to come to terms with his mother's choices. He never really got a chance to know who his mom was. And he was hurt behind his mom, you know. She used to write letters to Dominique and when uh, he couldn't read well, so I used to read the letters to him. She was telling that she was sorry for, you know, things, the decisions she made in life and, you know, keep the boxing up. In 2004, Dominique just missed a spot on the Athens Olympic team. Later that year, tragedy struck. I got a phone call that he had just been shot. He was playing with a gun. Russian roulette, he actually shot himself in the head and died. Shannon was devastated to learn of her son's death. She says she has taken some anger management classes in prison and hopes to earn the equivalent of a high school diploma by passing the GED exam. Although it's been more than a decade since Shawana was taken away from them, the Moss family is still coming to terms with their loss. Katima Moss was utterly destroyed and devastated by Shawana's death. I mean, they were um, mother-daughter team. I honestly think that if Katima ha hadn't had to have you know, raised Charles, Shawana's little boy, um, that she would not have made it. And for Shannon Buard, $3 cost her her freedom. It shouldn't happen. She felt like what she was doing was right because this man then took $3 from her and uh, she just wanted to get even with him. I think that as the root of all crime, it just it comes down to drugs. I think that's why she prostituted herself and I think that's why she made bad choices, um, but ultimately she is responsible for those.